dullest coast we've ever had, Johnny the Bod Bodwell. And the the if this was a poker game, the jackpot, <laughs> which is food in the middle of the table, it's all in, has grown exponentially it's here. Unbelievable. Show your cards, and you're getting it all. <laughs> hey, I love the bumper music. I miss, I really do. I miss those live uh, Christmas Eve concerts. Uh, so th- th- those were great. That was from uh, Chef Eric. Good ear mm-hmm. on you to pick that one back up there. Yeah. The, the band uh, we used to do, I think, for about seven or eight years, yeah. we did live Christmas Eve shows. At one point from Patterson's, at other times uh, live in the studio. And then the uh, the band kind of broke up and kind of went their own way. And, and that Isn't that the way it show. always goes with bands, right? <laughs> you, you have a good run, and then somebody decides, I'm going out on my own. Time to do something else. Darn that Yoko Ono. <laughs> she did it to us again. Uh, via telephone, Kelly Allen. She is the executive director of the West Virginia Center for Budget and uh, Policy. Kelly, good morning to you. Good morning. I have to say we're disappointed that you're on the phone because every guest we've had so far has been in studio and brought us food on the uh, way in. Uh, I'll have to do better next time. I'll make my way out there. Maybe yeah. she's going to door dash us something. Hint, hint. Oh, oh, yeah, that is possible. Not that we're begging for food. Just We just kind of did, though. Uh, Kelly, I know your organization, we talk with Seth uh, DeStefano an awful lot. And there are some concerns you guys have for the Hope Scholarship, which the state is, uh, ex- is, has expanded uh, since it was first established. Can you tell me what your concerns are in regards to the Hope Scholarship? Yeah, so thanks again for having me on. This is an issue we've been researching for several months. I came on your show a couple of months ago to talk about where Hope Scholarship funding was going. Uh, we found hundreds of thousands of dollars going out of state, uh, almost $2 million to unaccredited schools. But this follow-up piece, uh, we really wanted to take a look at the impact the HOPE Scholarship is having on our public school system. Uh, and we also took a look at kind of the lack of account- accountability and public reporting that's codified uh, through the legislation. So in regards to public schools, we found that just from funding diverted from public school districts to the HOPE Scholarship in the second year alone statewide, uh, our schools stand to lose up to about $21 million next year in the 24-25 school, uh, state school year, uh, and with it, up to 364 educator and personnel positions lost from funding loss to students leaving for the HOPE Scholarship. Kelly, if you could, could you please repeat those numbers again? Yeah. So, again, just from the second year of the HOPE Scholarship, uh, so students who are using it this year, those uh, funding losses will hit school budgets next year just because of the way that the state school aid funding formula is calculated. Uh, So statewide, we estimate public school districts could lose up to about $21.5 million uh, that, of state funding that's currently cu- funding 364 positions. So specifically in Berkeley County, the Hope Scholarship grew by about 360 students uh, this year. So we estimate next year that could mean Berkeley County will have about 26 fewer educators and five and a half fewer service personnel funded from state funding. Um, so that could mean, you know, fewer resources for our strapped schools, uh, bigger classroom sizes, all sorts of uh, potential consequences. And, you know, those losses will come at the same time that federal uh, COVID funding for public schools, ESSER funding, also expires next fall. And we know a lot around the state a lot of school districts are using that ESSER funding for personnel as well. Uh, so we just really want to put out the warning that even before the HOPE Scholarship is expanded, uh, this program is really having consequences for our public schools and the 250,000 students who get their education in those public schools. Could we make the case that with fewer students, the schools would need less dollars? I think that's what proponents often argue, but given that it's a relatively small number of children leaving any school district, uh, and those students are spread across grade levels in schools. In Berkeley County, I think you have 30 schools. You've got 13 grade levels. So those 300 and some odd kids are, you know, coming from 13 different grade levels, 30 different schools. So in any given classroom, you might lose two or three students. Not necessarily enough to get rid of a whole class, but you have a fewer teacher in that school. Um, so that's going to have definite consequences for those schools. Uh, we also know schools have, you know, high fixed costs, things like transportation. Transportation is really expensive in West Virginia, maybe not in your part of the state, but where we have r- rural spread out terrain, uh, building costs. These are, you know, just fewer resources for the vast majority of students who remain in our public schools. Oh, it's expensive here because we always have the highest fuel costs in the state, I think, between <laughs> ah, us and Bridgeport, yeah. John Bodwell, you had a question. I got a question. Do you know what the uh, level of proficiency is overall in the state for public school kids, you know, reading at grade level, math at grade level, stuff like that? I mean, the 
the indicators are that that it's way down. Um, what? Why is it? Why is it not a good idea to have another option when the option people are using may not be working for every student? Um, I had two of my three graduated from public schools. One graduated from a private school, and they've all done very well. But isn't it? If things are not working that well for a lot of kids, why? Why is giving them another opportunity, another option for parents? Why is that a bad thing? Well, I'll say for, you know, the vast majority of students who will remain in our public schools regardless, fewer resources are a problem. We spend about $1,300 less per pupil uh, in West Virginia than the national average. We also spend less per pupil than all of our neighboring states with the exception of Kentucky. Um, But I think you bring up a really good point about proficiency in our public schools versus proficiency in our private schools. There are really good private schools and there are really bad private schools. Um, So one thing we're calling on Uh, as a result of this report is more public accountability and reporting around uh, outcomes for Hope Scholarship students. You know, right now I can go to the Department of Ed's website and look up test scores for any public school in the state, uh, to your point. I cannot do that for private schools. Um, So we are calling on, you know, there to be some public accountability and reporting around test scores for students in private schools uh, and students who use the Hope Scholarship so that parents can have apples to apples comparisons. If they are, um, if they are using school choice, we want that to be informed choice. And we want to know that these places where we're sending our public taxpayer dollars to are providing a good education to our students. So that's one really big outcome we'd like to see is, you know, what are the proficiency scores in in private schools who are accepting the Hope Scholarship as well? I don't think that's an unreasonable request. Jonathan, do you? I think that's a great idea. I mean, I think that uh, I think that makes total sense. I mean, we need to know we need to know that where our tax dollars are going, that that it's working. Mm -hmm. There are I mean, and we have I mean, there are a dearth of teachers in public schools, private schools everywhere. What you were saying about we spend 13,000 a student. Part of that is because our teachers are very, very underpaid, especially here in the in the Eastern Panhandle. Is there, I mean, is there not a push? Do you guys, do you guys also push for, you know, locality pay for teachers in areas where we're losing so many of them to our surrounding areas, or just raises for teachers overall to bring up the average cost per student so that we can we can keep our better teachers, our our more our more seasoned teachers, so many of which in this area go to Maryland, they go to Virginia, I mean, they or they just leave the teaching profession altogether. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so we've had, we have three recommendations really as a result of this report. One is some public reporting, which we talked about. One is some guardrails. You know, if lawmakers don't want dollars to be going out of state or to unaccredited schools, they should, they should put those guardrails into the system. And the third is really that uh, lawmakers need to uh, reaffirm their support for public schools. Again, the vast majority of young people in West Virginia will continue to be educated through our public schools. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we are in this environment in the state of flat budgets uh, where every new expenditure essentially has to come at the cost of something else. Um, we've already heard the Senate Finance Chairman say if we want to do a raise for public employees, which would benefit teachers, we got to cut that equivalent amount somewhere else in the budget. Um, so in this current real austerity uh, budgeting mindset, every dollar for the Hope Scholarship literally does come at the cost of something else. Um, so if lawmakers want to put more money into a program like this, they need to know that it's working, and they also need to continue and reaffirm their support for strong public schools that continue to uh, educate most kids. And that, that requires good pay for our teachers. So totally agree. So, Kelly, this is Matt. Do you see a bit of a catch-22 that we would be in right now in order to get the reporting on the test scores and making sure that the private school education is doing as well, if not better, than the public school education, that's going to take some time. So two, three, four years, and as you mentioned, uh, the students coming out this year will affect next year's school year. So how far down the road do we have to go to get that testing and to kind of be able to compare apples with apples? without losing yeah. too many teachers and, and so much money along the way? Well, I think the, the way to thread that needle right now is to not expand the program any further until we're able to get that information. Uh, we know there's a trigger in the law that will expand the Hope Scholarship to all students, regardless of if they never uh, were in the public school system at all, uh, potentially in the 26th school year. Um, and it, at that point, the, the program cost is uh, expected to quintuple. 
Um, so this is, you know, really a ballooning program. And I, I think one way to do that is to make sure that we don't expand the program until we understand more about how the existing program is working. Um, we also know that in other states, other states are really cautionary tales. Um, in most states, voucher programs start pretty small, pretty narrowly with limited eligibility populations, and then they get the foot in the door and they grow and grow and grow. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of states, that's cannibalized states' ability to pay for other things, like their public education system. Uh, Arizona is really a cautionary tale. Uh, they're facing a budget crisis because they have year-round open enrollment. They actually don't know how many students they're going to have this year, what it's going to cost this year, because you can uh, apply and enroll every single day of the year. Uh, and they also have universal eligibility. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've also seen in other states test scores get worse when the programs get broader. Uh, proponents often point to um, uh, well, outcomes of limited programs. But we've seen in places like Louisiana and Ohio where the programs grow really fast that the, the test scores actually get worse for voucher students. Uh, and in two of those states, the uh, learning losses for voucher students is worse than the learning losses of the pandemic. So we really need to get our arms around what's happening before expanding the program. So let me ask you this, Kelly. This is Jonathan again. If it is found that the people who are in the voucher program and the HOPE scholarship program do better than public school students, I guess your organization would be in favor of exponentially growing the HOPE scholarships because we want the best possible result for kids. Well, I think um, we want the best result for our public school systems, which will, no matter what, continue to serve the vast majority of public students. Um, so we don't want a voucher system that comes at the cost of our public schools. So I think that's really important. We've also seen in other states that uh, a lot of those uh, receiving the vouchers, over 50%, are families who are already in private school. Um, you can kind of see that in the public reporting that the Treasurer's Office released last week, that half of all recipients the first year are kindergartners, and kindergartners are kind of a loophole from the public school requirement. That's the only age that you don't have to have been in public school already. So I think it is concerning, you know, if these vouchers are going to families who already were using the private school system at the cost of our public schools. So I think in those cases, um, that broad eligibility uh, would not be something that we well, would be supportive of. And if, and if you take, I mean, you said we spend about 13000 a pupil. I believe, and I'm, I, I believe I've read this recently, Washington, D.C., they spend about 31000 a pupil in their public school system. <laughs> and the percentage of kids who are at grade level is even lower than it is in, uh, in West Virginia. I mean, so so money throwing money at a problem doesn't necessarily make things better, make things worse. I mean, obviously, we have a lot lower cost of living, cost of land, cost of cost of most things to do with the school system compared to some some other states. You know, especially our neighboring states, Virginia being one. How how many students? Let me ask you this: What percentage of students this past year got a Hope scholarship compared to you know the the overall amount of students in the state, the public students, public school students? Well, first, let me uh, address your first point, which is um, evidence shows that increased public funding for public education does lead to better outcomes broadly, with low income students benefiting the most. Uh, so we know how to serve public school students. We know how to serve low-income students, and it is increased funding for public education. I mean, you all pointed to something earlier. We need to pay our teachers, make sure we can have qualified teachers in the classroom. Uh, but to your other question, the first year of the HOPE scholarship, there were twenty, about 2,300 uh, HOPE recipients, which represents about 1%. Uh, there's 250,000 kids in our public school system. Uh, this year, there were about 6,000, so about 3%. So it is really uh, a small number of students compared to, to uh, yeah, the, the number of students in our public school system. And what percentage of the overall budget, the overall state budget for education, went to the HOPE Scholarship for those 3% of the students? Oh, um, so it cost about $10 million the first year, so it'll about triple this year, $30 million. And, I, you know, that is... In the in the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively small part of the public education budget. But I think that's why we why we wanted to point to but, what does it mean for personnel in your county? What does it mean for educators in your person in your county? Percentage wise, is it commensurate with the the amount of students who have the Hope Scholarship? And are there? 
I mean, we, we could debate this all day long, but I mean, everybody knows there are school systems that are, are top heavy that have that have too uh, have too much administration, not enough money spent on the the ground as far as kids go. We have what I mean, what's this? I don't know what the smallest school system in the state is, but I think it has a couple thousand kids and they have a superintendent, a director of food, a director of this, a superintendent, assistant superintendent for like three, four different things. I mean, well, there you, are ways. Time, so give, give, give her your question. Uh, are, are there way other ways that we could cut this money to expand uh, the opportunities for parents who want to have their their kids not in public schools? I think that if you talk to both public schools parents, they would say that our schools have too few resources, not too many. We talked about pay for teachers. Uh, we know teachers are buying school supplies out of their own pocket. We know art and music programs are getting cut. So um, there may be ways that folks can trim around the edges, but I think most public schools parents would agree our schools need more resources, not fewer. Matt, final question? Yeah, Kelly, I just wanted to know, out of the number of students that have gone to the Hope Scholarship, do you have a breakdown of the numbers? Does it tend to be more of the younger students, elementary, as opposed to, say, middle or high school students? Yeah, so we know that data because the Treasurer's Office released it last week from the first year, and uh, half, half, nearly half were kindergartners. Um, and I think, you know, again, that points to a concern that Perhaps a lot of these are families that would have sent their um, kids to private school anyway because kindergartners have that loophole where they don't have to have the, the history in public school. And Kelly, a final thought in regards to uh, this study, your conclusions from it, and what you'd like to see change going forward. Yeah, I mean, our, our state constitution requires a thorough, uh, pu free public education, uh, and any policies like the Hope Scholarship that detract from that um, are, are a problem. We really need to fund our public schools. We really need to make sure we have accountability around the Hope Scholarship and parents can understand um, if it's working or not, and policymakers need to have that understanding. And where can our uh, audience members go to find out more about this report? Our website is wvpolicy.org. Kelly, good to talk with you again. Thank you so much. Say hello to Seth for me. Will do. Appreciate y'all. Merry Christmas. Merry Thank Christmas. You. Christmas.